All right, first of all, thank you very much for being here. When I saw that I'm competing with Path to Chrome, I honestly thought I'm going to be talking to an empty room and recording cameras. Thank you very much. I'm grateful. This is a very hard, uh, that's a very hard thing to compete with. And if you want to remember me, my manager says I'm a weirdo because my Chrome email yes doesn't match my LDAP. All right, so today I want to talk to you about building Chrome features that store data on users' devices. And the first thing I'm going to do is convince you that it's worth paying attention to this talk. So what difficult problems we're going to tackle and why this isn't super easy, even though you've learned to read and write files and things like that in school. Uh, then we're going to go over the storage primitives that we use to build features on top of. And then I'll give you details about two important primitives, namely SQLite and LevelDB. And this is going to be very technical. We're going to have code. We're going to look at it and get a first pass at understanding it. Uh, first of all, storage is difficult anywhere. Drives are slow, CPUs are fast. So no matter what you do, you can't make a blocking IO call on a thread that services UI. Uh, second, computers run out of power. Your desktop could get unplugged accidentally. Your laptop runs out of battery. When they come back up, users expect that Chrome will be uh, in a reasonable state. Maybe it lost their last few seconds of activity, but most of the stuff should still be there. Last, both hard drives and SSDs break. When they break, they lose data. We can't magically bring up dead data, but at the same time, we shouldn't crash because some file can't be read anymore. And this is hard no matter what you do, whether you're writing a server-side app or a client-side app or Chrome, this is hard. Now, Chrome has its own difficulties. If you're coming from other Google properties or from some other company, maybe you've managed the fleet of thousands of computers. Well, in Chrome, we have billions of devices. And we think of this as our fleet, because we are responsible for storing data on all these devices. Uh, if you work on the server side, you have a data center. And your data center has a few computer configurations. They're all fairly homogenous. You can understand how they work. Well, in Chrome, we have all sorts of computers, ranging from the Z840s under your desk to feature phones that Paul talked about earlier. So it's really hard to get an intuition for how your feature will behave on all the users' computers. Also, I just mentioned users' computers. We don't own this fleet. Unlike a data center, you can't just SSH into a computer and debug a data corruption or an out of memory or something you have. Uh, if you decide you're going to store more data or change your schema, you can't SSH in, run a migration everywhere, and be done. Users are going to update Chrome whenever they feel like, so uh, their drives are going to evolve at sort of different paces, and we have to deal with that. And last, you can't just go and collect all the data you need. There are user privacy concerns, so we have to be judicious, and we have limits on how much data we can collect. With that being said, it's really, really hard to build something from scratch. So let's never build something from scratch that handles all these problems. Uh, we have three classes of primitives. First of all, there's the file system. No matter what, everything will end up somewhere on the user's file system. You know how to read and write files, I assume, so we're not going to talk too much about that. There are relational databases. And think of relational databases as your default, your go-to, your workhorse. They work reasonably well. They scale reasonably well. They're a good solution for most problems. Relational databases are fast, but sometimes not fast enough. So when they're not fast enough, we need to break out fancier tools, like key value stores, where you lose some of the guarantees that you get with databases in return for raw speed. And if you're using a database, you don't have to understand too much about how a database works. But if you want to use a key value store, you need to know how a database works so that you know what you're missing out on and what you need to either build yourself or account for the fact that you're missing. So here's what a database is. You care about it no matter what, at least a little bit. Uh, SQL databases give you a powerful query language. And this is really nice if you need to iterate on your feature. You can do complex queries, multiple indices. You get migrations. If you want to code something complicated, you write more in your SQL query, recompile Chrome, and boom, your feature has been updated. You get a logical schema. So SQL is a declarative language. You say what you want not how you want to do it. And there are powerful query planners and optimizers that turn what you want into how that's going to be done. 
And this matters because it lets the database technology evolve independently from your feature. In a key value store, you have to write your query by hand, like literally by hand. You iterate through the database, you get what you need, you piece it together. So you don't have that property. Uh, over the past five years, SQLite has gotten about two times faster on some of the queries, and all the Chrome features that we built have benefited from this for free because we use SQL. Uh, you don't, again, you don't get this benefit if you're not on SQL. And last, transactions. Transactions are a huge thing because they let you deal with most of the problems that I talked about earlier. So transactions give you isolation, they give you atomicity, well, they give you a bunch of stuff that's commonly called as acid and that makes everything a lot easier to reason about. So whenever you write to a database, you think in terms of a transaction and then that transaction either happened or didn't happen and that's much easier than thinking of when I wrote to this file, did this sector make it to disk or not? When power went out, did some writes go out of order? What data got corrupted? So on. Databases give you transactions. Very good. Uh, databases are massive beasts. I think SQLite has, what, two, three hundred thousand lines of code? Uh, the API alone is thousands of lines of code. You can't read that in a few days. There's a lot there. And there are many people that spend their entire lives just in one of these boxes, just improving one of these boxes. And again, if you're using SQL, you don't care. If you're not using SQL, for any of these boxes that you lose, there's something real that your feature loses. And maybe you care about it, maybe you don't. If you care about it, you'll have to code it by hand. If you don't care about it, then you have to reason your design why you don't care about it. So especially if you're not going to use a SQL database, Come back to these slides, go through everything here, make sure you've thought about how you're going to deal with that problem. And spoiler alert, in the past, we've ran into pretty much every problem that's here when we didn't have the right box there. So these are real things that were problems in Chrome. All right, SQLite in Chrome. Uh, who has written SQL before, just out of curiosity? Oh, wow, lots of people. All right. Uh, for everyone else, uh, think of SQL as a fancier version of uh, Google Spreadsheets. So databases are tables. You write in queries that give you back tables that have rows and columns. We use SQLite. Uh, if you're coming from the server-side world, SQLite is slightly different from Postgres, MySQL, or Google SQL offerings in that it runs in process. There isn't a server somewhere else. This matters mostly because if you have races that corrupt your memory, that's going to end up as data corruptions because you're going to trample over SQLite's buffers and those buffers are gonna be written to disk. So it's harder to debug things. At the same time, we really wouldn't uh, be able to run a full SQL server on every user's device. So this is what we have to work with. SQLite is massively popular. These days, it ships pretty much everywhere. Windows ships it, Android ships it, Mac OS ships it, most Linux distributions ship it. It's on iOS, it's everywhere. And this means people understand how it works. You can get books on it, you can get Stack Overflow answers about when things break. Very well understood, that's good. Uh, if you have a query that just relies on the SQL standard, it will work. When you write your own queries, you're probably not gonna look up the 2000 page standard and see if your query matches the standard. You're gonna try it out. If it works, good. When you do that, make sure that you're testing with SQLite and make sure you're testing with the SQLite that we have in Chrome because we cut out some features to save binary size and it would be awful to design your feature and then when you're about to uh, do your code review, have tests fail because surprise, surprise, we don't implement that. Uh, also, SQLite has if you have used other SQL servers before, SQLite has this thing called type affinity, by far the biggest gotcha. If you're doing anything non-trivial, make sure you read the docs and understand how that works and why it matters. Uh, last, you can find the source code in third-party SQLite. As I said, it's hundreds of thousands of lines of code, so you're probably not gonna be able to read it. We have a lot of features built on top of SQL, so there are gonna be a lot of examples. Uh, we are going to be talking about history today, so that's the code I'll be showing you. And uh, SQLite on its own has a C API. It's fairly nice and well designed. People there are fairly thoughtful. 
but we use C++, it's much more high level, so we built a layer on top of that. And we ask that all Chrome features go through our layer. And all the samples I'm gonna show you today focus on how to use that layer. Uh, we use one database per feature. The best thing about this is that you don't have to reason about what happens to other features if your database file gets corrupted. You figure out how you recover from that and it's your plan. You migrate your database independently of everyone else and mostly live in your own world. Each database has a meta table and this is something we've implemented in SQL. And the main point of this is to get versioning. So it helps you version your schema. So even though not old features use it, you will and should use it in new features. And we generally try to avoid really fancy SQL features uh, for portability and just because not everyone knows a lot of hardcore SQL. So don't use triggers, don't use anything that's too hard. Concepts in our layer. When you open a database, you'll get a connection back. You will then prepare a statement, which lets you execute a bunch of SQL, plug in parameters, get out results. Uh, if you're not okay with a default model where every statement is in a transaction, you're going to use the transaction helper object, and that's kind of like a unique pointer for transactions where it makes sure that if you've opened the transaction, it's going to close when you go out of scope. So you don't leave dangling transactions in the database. And last, the meta table class is going to help you use uh, the meta table functionality we have. Let's look at code. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I read sample code, it generally takes me a few passes. You're not going to uh, get everything here. I don't expect you to do that, but I want us to do the first pass together. So I point out what I think is tricky and so that when you have to implement something, you're closer to getting it done. You've already done the first pass. So this has a massive blob of SQL in a string. That massive blob of SQL creates a table, so it's part of setting up a database schema. And you'll see that we're running it by saying uh, db execute. This is for one-time statements, so something that will only run once in the lifetime of Chrome. So it's good for database setup and schema migrations. Another example of pretty much the same thing, this time we're creating indices. So when you create a SQL schema, you have a bunch of tables and a bunch of indices. Next, we're gonna go over prepared statements. So when you read and write from the database, you're probably gonna run the same query multiple times. In that case, if you don't use what I just, I'm just about to show you here, SQLite is going to parse the query every time, build a tree, figure out how to run it, so run the query planner and optimizer, and then execute the query. You can bypass most of these steps by using something called a query cache. And the idea there is that the first time Chrome tries to execute a statement, it's going to do everything, and then it's going to get an object from SQLite that has most of the work saved. So next time when you get a cached statement, it's going to be pre-processed, the planner has already run, the optimizer has already run, so it just goes straight to executing. And uh, what is it, get cache statement gets you that statement from the cache. And SQL from here is a macro helper that builds a cache key based on the current location in the source code. So this is a very easy way to make sure that your queries have unique keys. Uh, next up, if you look after the SQL statement instruction, uh, you see where we pass uh, data into the parameters. So this query has two parameters, the question marks at the end of the string. And uh, when you cache a query, you want to cache it without parameters built in. In most cases, if you try to build a query by string concatenation, you will have a SQL injection vulnerability, another reason not to do it. So whenever there's user input involved, whenever something changes, question marks, bind string, bind in, bind what you need to bind. Next up, reading data. Uh, this example looks fairly similar to the previous example. There's a get cache statement that gives you a statement, except this time we are actually gonna look at what uh, the statement returns. So this is a select, the previous one was an insert. So the step function goes through each row in the return data set. I mentioned that's equal returns tables. And then once you're focused on a row, you have column helpers, and there's column string, column int, column bool, and these give you the data from the columns.
And last, I mentioned a lot of problems that have to deal with uh, working with storage. Most of the problems come together in the setup phase where you try to open the database. So here's where you're going to deal with I.O. errors. Here's where you're going to deal with schema migrations. Here's where you're going to deal with recovery. So most of the code is boilerplate-y. I would like in the future that this isn't the case. But for now, I'll walk you through what the boilerplate looks like and what it generally accomplishes. Uh, first of all, we set up the connection, plug in a bunch of magic numbers. You should need to learn what the magic numbers are. Talk to us if you need help. Uh, it's, like I said, mostly magic. And then you call open that passes, that succeeds or fails. So this is how you open your connection to the database. Uh, when you open the connection, you give it an error callback. And this callback gets called whenever something goes wrong as your feature is being used. And the boilerplate code for the callback runs some recovery code. And sadly, this recovery code isn't going to save you now. What it's going to do is make sure that next time Chrome runs, the database is in a reasonable shape so that maybe there won't be errors again. So if there's a transient error, we're not going to have the user stuck forever with a dead database. And the general pattern for error recovery is that you run a helper that we have that's called should recover and recover that does some magic. And then if that worked, you can keep using your database. If that doesn't work, you're going to delete the database and start over. This works very well for caches, because if you have the cache, that's great. If you don't, it's terrible, but not the end of the world. It doesn't work so well if you store things like user preferences. So there you're going to have to reason about what happens if I really lost everything. And we can't help you there, because we can't magically bring the data back from the dead. But we can try. At least we can make a few tries before we give up. All right, schema migration. Uh, lots of it is boilerplate code. So there are three main cases to think about. The happy case is when the user started Chrome after an update, and you're going to do a forward migration because you added something to your feature. The more challenging case is when the user didn't start Chrome for two, three years, and now they're starting it again. Lots of versions. You have to do a lot of updates. At some point, we say enough is enough. And most features say that if you haven't used Chrome in more than two years, you get a blank slate. And that's acceptable. For less than two years, we generally want to be able to migrate the schema. And the last case that you need to handle is that the user switched from, say, beta to stable. So that's actually a version rollback. And in that case, the database is too new. And uh, we say that we don't support this and it's best effort. We want to not crash if the user rolls back a version. But in general, if you added a feature, it's fine to wipe the database and say, look, we're going to start over. All right, and this is all boilerplate for doing what I just said. When you do migrations, it's important to do them this way. You have migrations that go from one version to the next one. Don't attempt to skip versions, because once you have a lot of versions you need to handle, you want your migration codes to be order n, where n is the number of versions, not order n squared. So always do one migration at a time. And if they fail, well, you give up and start over. All right, and this is how you've initialized the SQL database. Uh, I showed you everything. This is what you need to do to use SQL. Uh, let's go to LevelDB. So LevelDB comes from Google. It was extracted from Bigtable. It's a really awesome piece of technology with a lot of caveats. So once you learn how it works, it's great. If you build a feature on top of LevelDB, you should budget some time to figure out how it works and build a bunch of things by hand. Uh, so let me try to give you a heads up about what you need to budget for. So at a high level, LevelDB is super simple. Each database is a map of string to string. And the keys are sorted. And that's about it. Uh, what this means, there's a small API. You can actually go through the code and read all the include files that make up the API. This will take one to, at most, two days. You cannot do this for SQLite. It means you have to think of your own keys and values and what they mean. So a big benefit of all the simplicity is that everything can be super fast. And in some limited cases, uh, LevelDB can write up to 10 times faster compared to SQLite. At the same time, you have to wonder in your system if this I.O. is your limiting factor or if it's IPC or something else. So, Make sure you don't reach for it just because you see that the next number here. 
uh, on a bright note, level DB is designed for high throughput, so it does all the batching you'd ever need, so you don't need to think about optimizations, whereas some features that use SQLite do tend to wrap up their writes, uh, to batch up their writes, batch up transactions, things like that. It's not a relational database, so you don't get transactions, which I've tried to praise really hard before. <laughs> you don't get a schema, you don't get fancy queries. You have to write all that by yourself. These are the operations you get in level DB, and this is a subset of the header. It's get, put, delete, and that's really it. Level DB concepts, when you open a database, you get a DB object. You have a write batch, and this is as close as it gets to a transaction. You get to have multiple puts and deletes that will all either atomically succeed together or all fail. And then you have iterators that let you go over keys either in ascending or descending order. Uh, when you pass things to level DB, you either pass in STD strings, which are essentially byte arrays, or you pass in something that's called a slice, and that's like a string view. And last, level DB has this concept of an environment which wraps up all the file system logic. And we use these to tell level DB either write to a real file system or write to an in-memory file system. When you run Chrome in incognito, we don't want data making it to your disk because that's a privacy issue, so we give it memory environments. Also, when you're writing unit tests, if you can get away with a memory environment, your test is going to be much faster. Uh, six, uh, level DB is not as mature as SQLite in terms of our usage of it. We have a growing number of abstractions, but it's nowhere nearly as polished as slash slash SQL. So if you're building on top of it, look at these, but don't expect something as complete. We still use one database per feature. Uh, this gives you the same advantages that I talked about before, has some performance implications <laughs> that I'll skip over. I mentioned you need to think about how you design your keys and values. And here's a snippet from uh, IndexedDB's documentation. And you can see that a level DB key there has a bunch of components, and it's designed for extensibility. So this is the really hard thing when you do level DB. You have to design your keys thinking, what if I want to squeeze something else into this database a year from now or two years from now? For the same reason, values tend to be protocol buffers. Uh, Google library, you can read about it internally, also lots of external documents, and it's a good way to add extensibility without having to do a full database migration. Uh, code that uses level DB tends to be a lot simpler. We'll go through it fairly quickly. It tends to be interleaved with reading and writing protocol buffers, so that's what most of our samples have. Opening the database has a bunch of magic, exactly like in the SQLite case. And for SQLite, our SQL layer handles logging for you. So if a database produces an error, then we log that in metrics. And we had a metrics lecture today, but also you can go, if you're a Googler, and read analytics about how your feature is doing and how many errors you have and things like that. Uh, LevelDB doesn't have that, so you have to do it by hand. Really important when you're trying to figure out why half of your users can't get their saved data back. Error handling is a lot simpler. The opening the database succeeds or fails. If it fails, we drop the whole database and start over. Uh, this is an example of key formatting. It's mostly string manipulation. <coughs> when you write a feature, you will have functions that serialize and deserialize keys. And this is how you write to a level DB. Most of the code there is putting together a protobuf and serializing it to a string, and then put does the actual database write. This is how you iterate on level DB. It's a lot like iterating over a hash map in C++. You get an iterator, you increment it until it's done. Uh, this is how you use write batches. So you can use multiple operations. In this case, multiple deletes. They will all succeed or fail at the same time. And that's about it. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, very cool question. How do we store and secure user provided passwords? Uh, so this goes over a couple of things. It goes over storage and security, and we have a couple of answers 
depending on your platform. So in general, from a security standpoint, having someone else get physical access to your device is outside of Chrome's threat model. So the idea is that if you allow someone else to play with your computer, there's not much we can do there. They could change the Chrome binary and then completely own you. So in most cases, we store passwords in plain text in the database. Uh, there is an exception. I forget right now which operating system, but there is one operating system where we use built-in system features to encrypt your passwords with a key that's derived from your account password. So in that case, you lose your passwords if you forget your main login account password. So that was my question. I, yes. I also added Firefox provides a master password option that gets prompted every time before you launch the app. So I think that's, maybe that's what you're referring to. Uh, no, there's actually, uh, so on OSX, there's Keychain. Oh. where once you log in, you have access to built-in keys. So we use something like that. We don't have their master password feature. So our, our approach is simply that if someone can access your computer, they can do terrible things. Uh, for one specific example, you could very quickly navigate to Gmail, open up a dev console, copy all the cookies, and now you have their Gmail. And since Gmail uses single sign-on cookies, you probably have cookies for all of their Google account. So there's not much we can do there. All right, next question. How to avoid races while using LevelDB? Uh, great question, and I'm going to expand on this a bit and cover it for both SQL and LevelDB. So SQLite has built options that decide how thread safe you want it to be. We currently use the most thread safe option, which means you can use any SQL database from multiple threads at the same time, and it's fine. LevelDB has built-in concurrency, uh, and it's by default has full thread safety. So you can read and write from multiple threads to the same database, and it's just fine. You can't use multiple threads to write to the same write batch. That doesn't work. But same database, reads, writes, everything works just fine. Why is the string but not vector char? Uh, good question. So LevelDB was designed by uh, Google's two most respected engineers, I think, uh, Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gamawat. You'd have to ask them what, <laughs> why they were building it that way at the time. Uh, this was one of the first open source projects from Google. So it might actually be the case that STD vector wasn't a thing then, because the C++ library evolved over time. Earlier versions used to have errors in a lot of things. It might be something like that. And uh, why is it still that way? LevelDB wants to give people a stable API. So if your code works today, your code should work a few years from now. So this will never change for compatibility reasons. Do we have encryption out of the box, or does each picture have to provide its own encryption? Uh, we do not provide encryption out of the box. You should talk to security folks if you're thinking of providing encryption. There should be a very good reason for that. Given Chrome's uh, threat model, you will most likely burn the user's battery for no extra actual security. So throughout the talk, many times you said two things. First, it's magic. And second, if it doesn't work, we delete the database. Uh, so as a, like a developer for a feature, that does not really help if the <laughs> entire thing is just magic and the only solution for me is just to start over. Uh, how is that reliable to users in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, thanks for calling me on that. So to be clear, the magic part is tuning the database. When you open the database, you specify a few numbers there. And when I say that's magic, it means if you're willing to read a lot of docs or a lot of code, you can then know what numbers should mean. And then in the end, you'll still want to benchmark. Uh, in most cases, you can get away with talking to us, telling us what you're building, and then we'll say, these are the numbers you should use. I'm talking about the recovery magic. About the storage recovery magic, yes. OK, thanks. Uh, so it's magic in the sense that uh, it's hard to reason about what it does and when it works, and at the same time, I guess it might not be super useful. 
So I can tell you right now that for SQL, what we try to do is basically walk through each table and try to recover each key and value. So we try to recover each row. Uh, LevelDB has its own uh, thing that I don't know at this time how it works, but I can get back to you offline. So when I say magic, I mean you can probably live your life without knowing how it works. All right, thank you very much, Victor. Um, Thanks, oh, everyone. Any more questions? Yes. And next. Thank you.